Um, I've been asked to talk about uh, the threats, and um, we've heard a few of them already. Um, and it's interesting to see people's different takes on what threats are and where the threats are coming from, and, and also what things are not considered to be a threat. So uh, I was really interested in the, the Ofcom chart there, where, where oh, sorry to pick you out there, but, um, where they, they considered that uh, irrigation was at the lower end of the scale on security. And maybe that's okay in the UK, because obviously we get a lot of natural irrigation, right? <laughs> but uh, um, I would say that if I wanted to manipulate the markets for, say, pistachio nuts, this is quite a high, highly profitable uh, futures market for pistachio or cocoa, then if a large company had uh, implemented some widespread IoT solutions for, for irrigation, then I could do some pretty nefarious things just by preventing the doing some kind of denial of service or uh, preventing availability of that service for a couple of days. I can destroy the entire crop for a year and make a hell of a lot of money out of it on the stock market, potentially. <laughs> That's not a suggestion. <laughs> I'm keeping that one for myself. <laughs> um, so um, what clearly we've got is, is many different verticals in the IoT space and machine to machine. And um, obviously, all of those carry the, um, some commonality. So all of this stuff is essentially a PCB with some chips on it and some software. And a lot of that is common. But in terms of the physical environment and the threat environment, it, it does change quite considerably. Um, also, the attitudes of those particular industries and their, their attitudes to risk uh, changes considerably. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what I think about the car industry soon. Um, so, and this stuff's moving quite quickly. So although the IoT term is, is quite new, uh, this stuff's been around for quite a long time, just didn't have the marketing tag name. So there's a lot of connected industries. And um, it's starting to see now where people are trying to come together on some, some standards for around IoT. And there's a lot of fragmentation and immaturity. So we've got various standards that are coming along, like Thread, for example, um, where they are starting to consider security. There's other standards where they're, they're trying to mishmash existing technologies, for example, uh, trying to keep GSM alive for a, long, for a longer time uh, to bear the smart metering information, for example, which means we may, well, Steve Babbage will tell you, uh, we possibly need new A5 algorithms. <laughs> um, so uh, we've got a kind of mess, really, in standards right now. Um, you've got standards organizations like the ITU kind of going off into their own space of sort of fantasy <laughs> while the market is deciding what's going on. So there's uh, standards bodies like 3GPP and IETF who are doing some really, really good stuff and engaging industry, whereas ITU is broadly member states who essentially, well, I say, engaging in the realm of fantasy. So, but that's kind of dangerous because actually the ITU stuff often ends up in national regulation. So there could be conflicts in terms of the standards, as the, the Ofcom gentleman said. Um, so, and then there's also a lot of FUD. And FUD, so fear, uncertainty, and doubt, it's what drives the security <laughs> marketing of the ind industry. And so, uh, like antivirus for mobile, for example, the, the antivirus vendors traditionally have pumped out a lot of media material. But actually, the risk to the user is very low. In, in Western markets, particularly uh, on mobile devices. Um, but when you start to attach the physical world to stuff, people start to get really scared. And when you're talking about actuating things that could kill people, so uh, we met, um, I heard about the insulin pumps, so Jay Radcliffe and, and people like that who've actually, you know, Jay Radcliffe is a diabetic and he discovered those issues. And he was told to turn off his insulin pump, his remote insulin pump, because he'd probably be target number one not Dick Cheney and his pacemaker. So, um, and there's also the, the market reality is there's a lot of rubbish. There's a lot of, there's a lot of really bad implementations on the market being sold very cheaply. And, um, you know, we, we, we can't really get away from that. People, there's demand for it and people buy it and they don't have a clue what it is. We really, really need to clean up this, um, this situation. 
put, set this against what we've, what we've got in terms of embedded systems hacking. So my background is kind of investigating uh, hackers who will break into things like the SIM lock or break the IMEI on a mobile handset. And the mobile industry's done a hell of a lot in terms of hardening handsets. And, and that's why we've seen the emergence of things like Trust Zone from ARM and other technologies and other things, standards from Global Platform, ONTP and others. Um, but that's been driven by a group of people who really, really understand this stuff now. So you've got industries uh, and system integrators developing stuff that they don't really understand. And then you've got a set of attackers who totally understand this space. So it's not very good. And then as we'll see, most of these devices, the sort of IoT devices are being deployed, uh, are essentially headless, so, so no user interface. So there's pretty much no indication to see that anything's going really bad, and you don't know what it's doing, and you don't know what data it's gathering. So that's not a really good situation. So I put IoT in inverted commas, and I'm glad the, the question came on the last talk, because Actually, most of those devices are not directly connected to the internet, and I think very few of them will be. Um, we may start to see um, openly available public information, uh, for example, traffic information, things like that. That might be quite useful, but it probably will go through some kind of gateway uh, and be protected. But the main reason for that is because um, most of this stuff is some kind of um, local radio, short-range radio network that then goes to some kind of hub or a node and then gets shipped off either over a, 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 LAN, a wired LAN connection uh, or over some other kind of wireless long-range uh, mechanism. We've got to consider all, the, all of the other things as well which people are working on. So, so my particular expertise is around the device security, but this is kind of a system-wide situation. And, and I don't think, as someone else said earlier on, that there's enough uh, kind of bilateral communication or uh, sort of peer review between uh, people within the system. So a system integrator, for example, a car manufacturer, will take, uh, I'll give one example. So Harman have just bought Redbend software, and Redbend... Um, do a lot of uh, firmware over the air updates. So the reason that they've bought them is basically to do embedded systems, so ECU updates uh, for cats. It's a quite good move. But at last year's Black Hat, there was a very large expose of how bad the implementations of, of Red Bend software was. So the question is, is I, as a car manufacturer, what am I doing to make sure that Harman are doing their job? Actually, do Harman know what, what they've got on their hands? And, and this is all public, by the way. So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to understand whether, whether that is actually being done, whether peers will actually assure other peers and make sure that they've got some kind of certified pen testing going on. Uh, because, you know, it can't be done in a sort of top-down approach. We need to work together on this. So, coming back to devices, um, people break things. <laughs> That's the bottom line. People like to mess around with things. And most of this stuff that we're developing here, particularly in the IoT space, is physically accessible, often in very remote locations. So, we've got to expect from the outset that this stuff is going to be tampered with and physically broken in some way. Uh, probably one of the biggest threats, actually, is theft. And that could be disruptive, certainly disruptive to availability. Um, digital tachographs have been heavily targeted. The, we, we knew that that would happen because the analog tachographs were heavily targeted. So traffic, one of the kind of stories was a traffic policeman would uh, always go and check the inside of that cabinet uh, to see if it smelt of mint because uh, putting a polo mint underneath the needle meant that the driver's hours weren't recorded. <laughs> So it's a sure fire uh, sign that something dodgy might be going on if it's melted mint. Um, and people do things in very, very strange ways, stuff that's unexpected. So that's the real challenge and the art of what we do as security professionals. But we can't go into this assuming that our stuff's not going to be broken. It will be broken. It will be torn apart. And we have to understand. And so somebody else said earlier on, it's a, it's a question of risk management 
not about avoiding failure because you will fail at some point and it's about how, how quickly you can recover and how you can mitigate that to, to, uh, to the right, right extent. So, sort of take you on a little journey now, so through a couple of verticals anyway. So, um, a couple of people mentioned about um, privacy. So, people are piling into this from the vendor perspective and from the consumer perspective. So, you've got to ask yourself, why would a company like Google be interested in a shiny thermostat? Shiny thermostat that's got a lot of decent functionality inside it, actually. Google is an information company. It's their objective to gather as much information as possible. It's not, they're not incentivized to uh, prevent, for the user preventing them from getting access to that information. There's, there's nothing that, that, that is attractive to Google about that at all. So generally, they're not going to facilitate the user being in control of, of any of that functionality and denying that data from being sent. Plus, you're not really going to know. And so you're kind of giving arbitrary consent. And we'll talk a little bit more in a minute. But people are buying this stuff and connecting to the internet without realizing what the hell they're doing. So, um, and people will buy, always buy the cheapest things. So they'll go to Amazon, they'll buy a knockoff Foscam for 20 quid because the official one's 50 quid. And then they'll end up with this kind of thing. And so, sort of, a little bit of FUD. You know, the baby. <laughs> It's the worst thing ever, right? Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm being serious. <laughs> um, so, but the reality is, is that some people, they don't really know what they're doing, and they think it's great that they can access their baby webcam on the phone, but they don't realize that that data's transited the internet to come back to their phone. It's not actually contained within their environment. And often, the security's not there to protect them. So in the knockoff FOSCAMs, well, God knows what's going on, but usually there will be a default password and a, and a username that you can find on the web, admin12345. And um, even in the official variants, that's the case, although it's been changed now for FOSCAM. Um, there are tools to discover this kind of uh, stuff. So Shodan is one tool that, that you can look for this stuff. And um, so really you're exposing what is a very, very private space and very personal space uh, to, to a lot of stuff to people on the other side of the world. Um, we heard about the, the TV thing, and uh, we'll talk in a minute about dark patterns. But uh, I think, that to, to be fair to Samsung, actually, with, the, with the, uh, the voice data going to nuance, I think it was kind of the lawyers going a bit overzealous in terms of the just in case they captured somebody's extra you know, speech in that room. They wanted to kind of disclaim against that. I don't think they were deliberately going out to, to gather that data. But I would say that in most smart TVs, there's no granularity to what you can uh, uh, deny access to. And that's really the dark pattern. If you don't agree to the terms and conditions, then you don't get access. So you can't use any other service like Skype, for example, because you won't get access to the webcam. So we need to be a bit more mature about how those products are produced and, and what the user really wants to do. And obviously, privacy is very contextual. So it's a case of that, that user may change their views at, at some point, uh, depending on the time of day or place they're in or whatever. Um, so uh, last year's DEF CON. Uh, War Kitty and Denial of Service Dog. Um, although they're not the first to do it, um, the, uh, the CIA had Acoustic Kitty in, 19, in the 1960s, uh, which is, 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 this story is actually in dispute, but uh, so they, they basically got a surgeon to put some kit inside a cat. Um, a bit messed up, really. <laughs> but, um, obviously, I had far too much budget. <laughs> um, and uh, they successfully put the kit in the cat. And then apparently they sent it over to monitor uh, two blokes on a park bench, and it immediately got run over by a taxi. <laughs> the CIA apparently denied that this ever happened now, but, uh, but it's a good story. <laughs> so, um, 
But um, yeah, what, what this shows is that uh, potentially with some of this kit being used on the bad side, you can get a lot more access to stuff that you would maybe have not had access to before. And so spying on your neighbors uh, may, be, may be more uh, uh, easy to do, should we say. On the more serious side, um, it, in a quite worrying trend, there's a lot of people using uh, very cheap GSM modules, for example, in stuff that's fairly critical. So this is a real world example, the very remote place of the world. Um, the wind farms uh, were essentially discovered over the web and they happened to leave open some of the functionality on the SIM. So there was massive abuse, just, just sending to premium rate numbers, so just for fraud. So nobody was really monitoring the billing. This happens actually quite frequently on some M2M installations. And so at some point, I guess, they might have a bill limit of a million quid or something. So when does that actually impact that? And that's, a, that's just a pure fraud. But it's, it's on a physical thing. It could be that, um, and I've seen this as well, is that the SMS channel is being used to actually activate something, which is quite worrying, because I wouldn't trust SMS. <coughs> so a lot of cheap materials being used. Interestingly, the, the Raspberry Pi A is still being produced, apparently, because it's being so widely used in industrial applications. <coughs> so can... Anybody tell me what the default username and login for the Raspberry Pi is? Pi and Raspberry. <laughs> Just checking whether there's any engineers in the room. <laughs> That's every Raspberry Pi. That's not a good situation at all. That's a bad security design pattern because they don't know what this stuff's going to go into. And you can't rely on the user or the enterprise to get it right. Actually, the security should be built in, so secure by default. Um, automotive. So um, I, I, I promised somebody that I'm going to do an entire presentation just of these street signs. If you type in hack street signs into Google, they're brilliant. Um, so um, this is, uh, this is uh, Charlie Miller um, and Chris Valasek. Um, hacking into the CAN bus uh, a couple of years ago uh, of a car. Now, this was like a local attack. It's actually not that sophisticated because um, getting access through the OBD2 port's pretty easy. Uh, we're doing a load of work, actually, for, for, a, uh, for the police at the moment on sort of the futurology around this. So we'll be looking at, for example, uh, in this case, what happens if somebody just flicks the lane open for a couple of seconds or five seconds, cause an accident, and then closes it again. Where's the evidence behind that? So there's a kind of networks analytics question and a monitoring thing, but there's also probably a hardware interlocks question around that as well, in that if this sign on this side of the road uh, is closed and that one's uh, closed then you know, or open, then should the two be open at the same time? No, they shouldn't. And uh, in one of the hacks, again, at DEF CON last year, uh, a guy was hacking traffic lights, and he tried to switch them all to green. And he couldn't because simply of the electronics design. So again, a good electronics design pattern to essentially hardware interlock the security. So you know, we should combine uh, our sort of hardware security and logic uh, as well as the software security too. So. Um, you know, we're going to hear a lot about the, the threats. I think we actually know most of the problems, and most of these systems are based on Linux. Uh, the hardware's usually similar. We've had all of the experience that we've had in the mobile industry, as somebody else mentioned. We need to kind of transfer that out into the rest of the IoT uh, verticals and encourage other industries to actually adopt the security. So, um, for example, some work we've been doing with the GSMA, um, so they're not a standards body, but they're more an industry forum, but they're trying to lay out the strategy for, for, for because the mobile industry are very concerned about some of the more insecure devices that may uh, 
send data over the mobile network. And you have to remember that in some countries, there's not a lot of fixed line network at all. So most of this traffic is going to go over the mobile network. But I don't see there's any point in reinventing the wheel in a lot of cases. There's a lot of stuff that we can reuse. So um, the, the people looking at, oh, let's create a big threat database related to IoT. Well, actually, you know, uh, there's CVEs for that sort of stuff, right? Heartbleed has a CVE. Um, one thing that doesn't exist is there's no mobile cert, mobile industry cert. I think that's a gap that, that needs to be filled. And potentially, that could be an IoT cert, specifically uh, aimed at threats around that, that uh, area. So that's a po potential opportunity. Um, but looking at uh, hardware security, um, perhaps, and I don't know exactly how we're going to do this, but how do we prevent the critical infrastructure using the cheap rubbish? You know, the fact that the same temperature sensor that's being sold in B&Q for my shed is also being used in this chemical plant over here is a bad situation, and we need to kind of resolve that in some way. But also, um, I don't think that we can suddenly come out with this miraculous solution, this is IoT security. We, we just The gradual step change does work, and so let's not try and expect that we're going to kind of solve this. So I think this, the mantra of secure by default is a good thing. It's very, it's very easy to understand, especially for uh, industries that just never uh, entered this area at all. So it's easy, to, it's easy to articulate to people. But... Some of the things that I'd like to see personally, so we talked about the hardware interlocking. The, so these, I'd like to see somebody come up with a decent set of security design patterns for IoT that you can take out and you can give it to system integrators or you can give it to particular sectors, to their uh, industry bodies, to give to their members and to mandate to their members. But then obviously, um, you've given them all the help and the education you kind of need to make sure that actually the stuff is performing to spec. So we have a very well-developed uh, industry around uh, penetration testing and fuzzing. So fuzzing is how Heartblade was discovered. Um, you know, that kind of thing we can mandate as a country. Why not? It's protecting, it's protecting uh, our industries. It's protecting our populace. But there are major issues that we actually need to solve. Very, very big problems. So software updates is a big problem for the mobile industry. It's going to be an even bigger problem for IoT, uh, particularly around end-of-lifing. Um, we need to somehow work out how we eliminate those unacceptably insecure uh, uh, implementations from the market. That's not trivial. Um, I think, again, something that we can mandate is hardware-backed security. If you're putting some crypto into something that's physically accessible in the public, you should not be storing the keys in anything else other than hardware secure storage in 2015 onwards. Um, how we address the problem of counterfeit, personally, I think we need to deal with the source. So there are particular countries in the world that we know are the main sources of counterfeit products. There needs to be international pressure on those countries to deal with it. We cannot, it's kind of like the drugs problem, we can't just keep deal with the, with the consequences all the time. And then the life impacting solutions, this kind of gets into net neutrality debate as well, because actually you need to assure the uh, persistence of communications for uh, critical devices like um, uh, health devices. And then the final point on this slide is about um, sector leadership. So we have the uh, car industry in here and we have the mobile industry in here. It's absolutely crucial that we, that we see that leadership. And uh, we've got, I see we've got uh, Mario here. These old bad practices in some industries, so suppressing security issues, hiding them, threatening researchers with legal action, you know, basically stifling academic freedom, that's really, really wrong. And we know in the computing world, in the mobile world, that that doesn't work. 
And we need to fix that situation and, and educate those other industries that that doesn't work and break that kind of that old mentality. So just one small point. If you go down into the sensors, which we've been doing recently, there's a quite scary thing. I don't think there are any really decent sensors that you can assure properly. So we can go to the IoT device, but the sensor itself is not secure, and relying on that information is quite worrying. So um, I think that's a future problem that we will have to deal with. Um, obviously, the, the constrained device issue. Um, the issue of about uh, being able to attest the, 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 the value of something. You know, if we look at hacking Reuters and sending out a tweet saying that the president's been shot, it massively affects the world's stock markets. So if we start to rely on, on these sort of single points of failure accidentally, because people, multiple sources are going to it, so temperature, for example, or previous attacks on the network time protocol, lots and lots of things rely on it. And what you're going to see, I think, is very subtle manipulation of trusted data that actually comes from an untrusted source. So um, have a think about that, and uh, hope I haven't scared you too much. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks.